do any provocation with the Russian federations, but they, they invade the Ukraine. And I want just you imagine that in your country, invade the Russia it ta and take some state and say that there it's their own territory. How it's feeling like you are the uh, people of this country. I will tell you the story of patient from the massive casualty. It was the the largest massive casualty that our hospital and our city see maybe for a long years. So our hospital is the biggest hospital of the west of the Ukraine. On this map, you see our country. It's the largest country in the Europe. And here it's my city. It's city near the Poland border. It's the biggest city. And um, we also have the biggest civilian hospital in Ukraine. It's for the uh, 100, 1,500 patients. So the Russian forces um, strike by using the mm, missiles that was um, strike near 1,000 kilometers from this location from the Baltic Sea. It was near 51 missile. The training, the biggest training center, military training center of the west of the Ukraine, where in this period was a lot of British soldiers, and then unfortunately was died. So um, in this, uh, after the attack of the rock, we have the 155 victims. It was all the military who have the serious injuries they that need emergency operation and 35 patient was died on this place uh, where strike was done so the story happened like this uh, on the battlefield there was some type of triage after the air strike because it's the closed military base the, after the air strike the most nearest hospital to the air base near 10 kilometers if it's the it was the small um small like country hospital that have a small surgery department maybe for the 15 patients there work i think maybe 10 surgeons and on duty was three surgeons and uh, after the uh, and they see like this was on the work and they see that um, military cars started to bring in the victims some victims come in the ambulances some just laying in the in the uh, normal cars and they trying to they started to receive these patients uh, during the triage all the patient was red and the new patient was in the black black category but this hospital have totally no experience with such type of uh, mass massive casualties so they tried to take him to straightly to the operation room a few patients and during an uh, examination tried to do the first like the damage control i will tell the story about just one patient from um, that case and this patient was the i think the most difficult patient who had a life after who, who who didn't die after that uh, total injuries and how was story about so the patient was examined uh, examin uh, was um, examined before the hospitalization in the hospital after the examination they uh, they see that the patient have the um, very serious injuries is shrapnel open wound of the thoracal cavity with massive wound of the skin no sternum present it was the big hole uh, pericardium we we can see this in this hole and also during the examination the, we see the connection uh, the wound with the thoracal cavity the more diagnostic we can uh, they this doctors of this hospital can do because the new patient arrived and arrived they straightly take the patient of the in the operation room and see such uh, intraoperation findings so there was explosive shrapnel injury combinated injury blunt blunt trauma of organs of thoracic cavity 
presenting chest injury, the thorn wound of the anterior, anterior uh, surface of the chest, rupture of the right dome of diaphragm, traumatic open right side pneumothoraxis, closed left side pneumothoraxis, fracture of the skeleton of the chest, intra-abdominal bleeding, torn wound of the upper limb, partial separation of the ear, thermal burn of the right hand, multiply laceration of the left forearm, open marginal fracture of the external colony of the left humerus with the uh, satisfactory position, open fracture of the base of the fifth metatarsal bone and a serious traumatic shock. On the photo you, hear, you can see how the wounds of the face and neck region look like. It was the hand. Um, and what I want to ask you what on the photo is the, the chief of Ukrainian army, the general. And I want to ask you what you will do in this case in the, when you are in the operation room. What the first stage from the damage control, when you see such um, damages of the patient, what you will do in this case? Yes, please. Sir, I'm not sure if this is the uh, operating room, but I'm talking about mass enriched airway respiration. As the people in the Okay, thank you. Very nice. And also you need to remember that in this hospital they have the 89, 90 victims still coming. They don't, small hospital, only three sergeants there. So maybe you like a sergeant before operation, you do some more. You give information about this case or just start to operate. Operate because you don't have a time. This patient is bleeding. Okay. So the first operation that was done, the first, the doctor and the duty for this hospital called uh, for, um, give this information for the central of the emergency center. I like the chief of the biggest uh, department in the West of the surgery department of West Ukraine was informed and we have also the big question one what to do in this case so we understand that a lot of patients staying there also with together with that patient so we make the decision to give 10 patients from uh, 10 uh, sorry 10 doctors sergeant from this from our hospital to go into their hospital to help them in the damage control the first what was was done with this patient is was the rough intubation and uh, drainage of the pleural cavities so you was right and during the revision rupturing of the sternal sternum rupturing of the ribs from the sternum uh, also the diagnostic was done rupture of the right dome of the diaphragm rupture of the four and five liver segments rupture of the small intestine they do that on the first operation with the bandage. Now you need to understand that their small hospital is uh, located with this red dot. It, and you see here this Lviv city. It's our city when our where our hospital located. It's near 40 kilometers. I think it's, not, it's uh, near 20 miles from our hospital. So it's very short distance. So what you do in this case when you operate the patient, you have a lot of patients that are coming, you're still uh, trying to, with this doctors that go in this hospital, manage the patients there, or you will do something different. Started maybe to um, remove this patient and transport to the biggest and uh, next line hospitals. Yes, I think it's a very simple question, but it's right and it's true. So uh, this patient and another, a lot of patients that was stabilized, stabilized was transport, were transported to our, to our hospital. And um, on the damage control, we done the cleaning, dressing of the face wound and extremities and the face. Drainage, both of the red drainage of the both 
pleural cavities with the uh, larger tubes. Uh, and we put the occlusive bandage of the chest cavity, uh, suturing the diaphragm and liver was a little bit less sutured. And we, we already received the patient with the abdominal packing that they were they done in this small hospital. In our hospital, we already have a possibility to do more deep diagnostic because our hospital is large. We receive also near 60, 70 patients from this incident, and we have a 45 operation room, but we used 30 operation room and have a time to make the diagnosis directly in this patient because he was very difficult, but he was um, um, a little bit, he became a little bit stable. So we have a we diagnosed an explosion of shrapnel injury, combinated injury, blunt trauma of organs of thoracal cavity, penetrating chest injury, torn wound of anterior surface of the chest, rupture of the right dome of diaphragm. It was all the part that they diagnosed, but also we have a we diagnosed the blunt trauma of abdominal cavity. A laceration of the right hand is the same. Um, and after we do the second step of diagnostic is the CT scan that we see on it the shrapnel near the left pulmonary, pulmonary artery and uh, in the abdominal cavity. Intestinal contact and well from the lapar uh, lap uh, laparotomy wound. So we see the patient that uh, it was uh, the diagnostic we do after the few hours and we left this, left this patient as you departed to stabilize him. But on the next day, we see that the bile is come from the laparotomy uh, wound. So we understand that the patient need to go to the next step operation and on the see the high ional in, uh, intestinal rupture also it was a little bit bleeding diffuse peritonitis at that time and massive wound of the chest uh, it was the um, was labo laboratory criteria of the patient at that time you can see the protein hemodynamic was stable but with adrenomimetics and uh, what your tactic, what you do intraoperational in this case. So the main qu question is to suture the um, intestine or put the stoma. What you will choose? Stoma, okay, why? Okay, but what about the proteins, you can say? It's, uh, it's important in this case? What do you think? Okay, some more opinion maybe. If not, so what we do, we uh, thought that we need to suture it because it was very high injury and the possibility to put the stoma was very low. Uh, that's why we suture it, but we suture it with the... Um, machine line anastomosis uh, not with the hand anastomosis and uh, i already said it we, we put already the drainage of the abdominal uh, cavity we remove the uh, packing of the abdominal cavity and we do the very interesting operation it was the first in my life such type of operation that i use but it works good we close uh, the chest defect with the uh, greater omentum. So here is very interesting. It's like the situation after the hour already the second finishing operation, and I will try to explain to you how it's look. So this is the diaphragm. Here we have the thoracal cavity, and you see there is no sternum present. Here we see the here is the abdominal cavity. Uh, here you can see that the omentum myas we put up it and close the defect of the chest. So we close the pericardium, everything with the omentum. And here, here omentum, greater omentum, so he goes up. 
the lower part of that is the uh, abdominal cavity. So we finish operation like that. After the operation, uh, patient beca becomes significantly worse. So he have the no urine and the bowel movements. He have some of the clinic of the paresis. He have signs of the multiply organ dysfunction. But he have no problems with face wound. After surgery care, we make the debridement. Um, have, still have a large defect of the soft tissue on the left shoulder. It was a little bit infected but also debridement burn injury of the right hand it was this the second and the third stage of the burns not um, difficult and um, he have also exploded explosive wound of the lateral surface of the foot with massive defect of the soft tissue open fracture of the fifth metatarsal bone present in the wound but we Understand that also they're staying the shrapnel near, very close to the pulmonary and artery. So here is the CT scan of this situation, and you can see the location of the shrapnel. Also, you can see the momentum here already, yes, in the place where it needs to be the sternum. So, about these um, laboratory parts, uh, you see the creatinine, urine, and like this, it became very high. So, what is your tactic in this situation? The main que question is, would you rem would you take the patient in the operation room and would you remove this foreign body the staying very close near the pulmonary artery and the second question for me would you do the open operation in this case or would you do this thoracoscopic please maybe some minds or thinkings it's your case you are in icu department after a few years, probably. <laughs> so you have some opinions? Mm -hmm. Did you afraid about the bleeding from the uh, in injury of this artery, is this uh, pulmonary artery? Okay, nice. So at the period of this situation, we have a possibility to have a consultation with our American military doctors, especially with John John Holcomb. Maybe you know about him, and it was also a, diff, a difficult decision for him to because. In this situation, we understand when we do the open thoracal operation, it's another big injury to the patient that's staying not stable. But also when we doesn't do this, we can have a possibility of the bleeding with uh, that the possible of managing of this bleeding. This patient is very low and probably he will die from this bleeding. So we choose to do the thoracoscopy operation to understand what is in the lateral chest, if there is some hematoma and like that. So we do the thoracoscopy and what we see after the operation, this situation, but in the thoracoscopy, there is, was no shrapnel already. It moved uh, maybe intraoperational, maybe before you our operation in the, uh, pulmonary sinus so was everything fine it's take near 15 minutes in operation room or 20 and he goes back
to the ICU department and that was the CT scan after the uh, our operation and we see that already uh, the shrapnel changed their location it's, uh, in the low part of the dry frag. So after the operation it already was two weeks we have um, like it's look like a frozen abdomen and the intestinal dermal dermal fistula but the patient was a little bit septic and um, what's your tactic what do you do in this stage when the patient two weeks after the injury he became better he already uh, extubated uh, his consciously he can speak but he have a fistula he have a few wounds of extremities how you will work with this fistula your opinion it's uh, also our president if you know him have some opinions so who will answer the question will have some presents from ukraine so if you don't uh, uh, know what to do i want to say what do we do in this case we also don't want how to work with this patient but we le left this fistula uh, because he don't lose a lot from it and we started to feeding patient make him a little bit more activity and that's like looks this open abdomen at that time and now in ukraine we have a bad possibility with the mm, you need to understand it's because here it's and especially in army you don't have such problems in us army we have a very big problems with the supply so we don't have like the aptera system and like that and we use uh, you see this needle sometimes we use it like it's the prototype of abra system to close temporarily close the abdomen here already the next photo it was maybe two three weeks after the operation here the defect of the sternum and here the open abdomen and uh, here it's already maybe one month on, after the operation the patient have this small fistula it it's look already like the frozen uh, abdomen and the total view of the wound at the same time the patient have still the burns of upper limbs the fracture of the uh, stabilized fracture of the mm, left upper limb and lip Le, uh, lip tear suturing what the next problem that we have in this patient it was the open fracture fracture of the fifth metatarsal bone with early osteomyelitis because he have the open wound in the wound was present the bone and here you see it's very bad option to close this tissue in this location it's maybe orthopedics but what we do we start to debride this wound also with our American colleagues, colleagues, because in that time they already come to our hospital, our country to help us. And um, we try to do here, you can see, we try to do the skin grafts to close the wound, to have a small fistula. And we tried that, we thought that it can be um, closed, but it don't work. You see the necrosis of that. So what your option in this case? It's already not acute patient. It's already patient that needs some reconstruction that have ostem only osteomyelitis and the fistula of intestine. What your minds and thoughts about this wound? Maybe someone wants to be the reconstructive surgeon or orthopedics. I think you know something. <laughs> about the food mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay thank you 
So what we do in this case, we try to do the re uh, reconstructive operation and close the wound with the rotation flap. It's the most easy way of the um, reconstructive surgery. At this time for us, it was also new, but I very you know, like the proud of my clinic and my doctors because for these few months, we already start, started to do microsurgery. Before it, we do the, just microsurgery of the hand. But now we do the free flaps and close this defect with different free flaps uh, operation. So that, that was our maybe first reconstructive operation in the clinic that we done. Uh, we use the muscle to rotate it and to close the defect after the operation it's look like that the muscle and closed by the skin graft so thank you for your attention and uh, i want to ask you for a few questions and uh, also i want to thank you for supporting the ukraine it's very important for my country and i thank you for the help I want also to show you the, uh, it's the my city. It's a few days because, uh, because before I am go, I go to the U.S. here to visit you. So you can see how the Russians strike our city. It's the peaceful city without the forces. It's far away from the uh, front line, uh, front of the war but they destroy the civilian buildings the hospital and the um, infrastructure of ukraine here you can see the view from my office from our hospital so you can understand how close the um, strikes are done and also you need to understand in what now in what conditions we work so now we work in the special shelter when we have the air serene in morning this morning i have a special alarm in the on the phone on my phone so it was also the serene but we still in fighting for our freedom and independence so thank you for your attention and thank you I also want to say if we have near eight minutes, I can demonstrate the lecture that I demonstrated for the College of Surgery. It's a little bit about the tactics uh, in the health system of Ukraine, how it's worked after the war started. If it's interesting, it can be uh, shown. That would be great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. So, now what's happened now in Ukraine? Here is more detailization about the um, healthcare system. So, what the difference between the war in Iraq and Afghanistan we have in Ukraine? Here, uh, the red line, you can see the occupied territory of the Russia. Now, uh, the Ukrainian territory and the white is territory that controlled of the Ukraine forces. Uh, there's another color you can see the health of the regained by Ukraine territory and you need to understand that the war is going between these lights so from Lviv to this regions near 1000 kilometers and it's near 500 miles it's far away 
our hospital is the biggest hospital on in the west of the Ukraine. It's near over 1,200 beds and it's full spectrum of trauma care. So we have like different, we have in, in vascular invasive surgery, a lot of CT scans and like that. Here are the different injuries that we have uh, um, after the war started. We was only the civilian hospital, but we have a big experience with working with the civilian injury. But when the war started, we have also a lot of wounded patients. This war, it's very modern war. So um, maybe such type of wars, it was like the first or second world war when the both sides used the high quality equipment of that time in the all different wars that was two years ago like afghanistan iraq you understand that one side like the u.s army or different army have the strong army and this another side don't have a, such equipment that's why we have very difficult injury because in this war use a lot of rockets there is no contact with the forces only special forces of ukraine have the direct contact with the russian forces so that's why we have a, a very big shrapnel wounds and also you see we have a lot of women's children's because uh, the russians strike into the hospital schools they just trying to destroy the ukrainian nation we have a lot of injury of the face and neck part um, and these days we do already and started to do the free flap reconstructive operation with the help of our U.S. partners and the partners from the United Kingdom. Also on this uh, picture here you can see that we're trying to uh, teach our residents and it's very important I know from some doctors that here you have a problem with this in your ass, but it's very important to residents and for doctors see post after the patient died after he died with after maybe your some operation to see it's uh, after that how it works inside what what the mistake was how look the internal organs and like that so our uh, hospital already treat more than um, fifth thousand patients that was suffering on uh, from the war 300 of the and 40 of them it was the patient with direct injury that was operated and uh, 242 it was uh, military patients what we understand after the war started that we have a lot of the martial casualty incident arrival that we need to use triage we know that but it was hard to like when you read it from books and see uh, it from some movies to do this practically because for the doctors very hard decision to understand this do you have some patient with the black color especially in the civilian hospital also we have increased demand of the blood transfusion no experience in using whole blood we have we now have a special ic protocols for that patient we have probably the logistic of the evacuation and communication with the doctors on the front line. Problem with the multi drug resistant infection and low experience in reconstructive surgery. We help we have strong help from our American colleagues. Well, with that, we started to work in operation uh, rooms, ACU department, and we mm, um, we stopped a few problems that we have with their experience and help. The first, we adapted of the world best practice, the surgeon with experience. Um, um, we started to put them in the small country hospitals to train the doctors and the civilians. It was the part that they're talking about. Um, what problem, the most problem for us was that uh, we have the very big problem you, in Ukraine with the blood transfusion. In Ukraine, it was not allowed to transfuse the whole blood. It was illegal, and um, the doctor that do this could go to the prison. But we hear the U.S. experience in, in my department, in my hospital, we tried, started to do the first blood transfusion in the cases 
that we needed, but it was still illegal. And after that, we have the conversation with Ministry of Health of Ukraine. We show our good results after that blood transfusion. And we have the new rule that we already can work with the blood, all blood. Uh, also, we don't have a knowledge about heating of the blood. So we heat the plasma with the, uh, we, we don't have a special like uh, machines to do this. We just heat with, with the high water like this, but we also now have some supplies of heating machines. We decrease the, we decrease the usage of the saline solution before, because um, before the war we use it a lot. And also we uh, use the new standards of uh, vitality monitoring and apply bl blood heaters. Here you can see how uh, evacuation works in Ukraine. In Ukraine, before war, we evacuate the civilian patient with the helicopters, but Russia strike every helicopter they see, it's no matter if it's for the patient, for the military that are injured. So in Ukraine, only safety way is to use this, uh, the trains. We um, transform into the ICU trains, and we uh, trans tr uh, we um, take the patient from the front line. It's near 100, uh, 1,000 kilometers. So we have the next big problem because the patient, after three days staying in small hospital, that have not good supply with the antibiotics, with the um, a lot of knowledge is how to care with the um, uh, with the uh, trauma control, the patient have a lot of the infection and mostly all patients that are coming from the front line, they have the serious um, infection that are, um, that are multi-resistant and as especially I think it's the most popular is the acinobacter infection. Um, so it's uh, done work. Now, um, our main thing that we want to do is to build our National Rehabilitation Center for the militaries and civilians. I probably think it's the same uh, institution that we are here now. It's very important for our country because we don't have before the rehabilitation center. There we want to do the rehabilitation about the mental health care, reconstructive high quality surgery department, orthopedic reconstructive surgery department, and also the prosthesis because we have big problem in Ukraine now. We have a lot of militaries and civilians that need the prosthesis, but um, we have only few factories that do this. So it's our big project, and for this project, we ask the donation for, for all of the countries that support the Ukraine. So I will present you uh, a few T-shirts with this name and also give the flyers with this presentation. And if it's possible, you can also support us. So thank you again, and thank you for invitation. It's a big honor to be here. Thank you very much. And I want also to ask you, can I make with you photo here for memory and for showing our old hospital that we are together with you? Okay. So, uh, Hana, great, uh, great talk. And I have a comment and a question for you. Then we'll, you. Dr. Woodson has a comment and a question, then we'll open for questions. Uh, the comment, and this is really, I think, very important, and it reinforces something that I think we saw when we're in Iraq and Afghanistan, is that you know, the patient that you showed, you walked us through the clinical care of a very complex patient. What's critical there is that although the logistics of conflict are different, the supplies you have, the patient populations, whether patients are wearing body armor or not, the antimicrobial resistance, the biology and the care of those patients is the same, right? And every step of the way that was dealing with one problem at a time, you know, take that chest wall defect, you know, bringing a mental flap up, 
that's something we learned from taking care of patients with mediastinitis, you know, uh, dealing with the osteomyelitis, dealing with the EC fistula. Every step was based on principles of practice that you're able to put together in the care of one particular patient. I think that's really important because when we talk about future conflict, we tend to lose sight of that. But the biology is the same. You have to adapt to the logistics that you're dealing with. So that is really important for all of us to see that and just re remember that, you know, the basic biology, the basic principles, and bringing that together in a complex patient. So really well done, uh, of course. My question for you is you talked about antimicrobial resistance. You talked about acinetobacter, which is, you know, the um, – the bio burden that we saw a lot in Afghanistan, coming out of Afghanistan and Iraq. The other question I have for you is, have you seen a fair amount of invasive fungal infections with things like aspergillosis? Uh, that was another bio burden that we saw uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was particularly challenging to care for those patients. Thank you. Thank you for your question and for your comments. So about the first question about the acinobacter infection, we have really no experience how to work with that because it's non-popular infection within the civilian life. And also in Ukraine, we have such problem that we use very, like we understand already, and it was traditional there, we use the old-fashioned antiseptics local. We use the betadine. It was more the most popular antiseptic that we use. And we um, understand that this don't work in these cases. So we, we try to use, with the help of our American colleagues, the Akin solution. And this uh, local treatment of the infection gives us a possibility in some cases to don't use total antibiotic therapy. So the patient wounds can be only treated by this um, debridement and the using of the an local antiseptics. It's our experience. And the second question, it's about the fungus infection, yes? So at this time, really, we don't have the patient with this infection. Maybe it's some different environment in Ukraine. It's hard to explain, but we still don't have this. Thanks. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Well, congratulations uh, uh, on a number of levels. Uh, first, uh, to the Ukrainian people for their perseverance. Uh, I think never um, has the world been in such a dire strait since 1939. And so uh, we clearly stand with you, but uh, congratulations to the Ukrainian people for their, their perseverance. Also, congratulations uh, to your medical system for a rapid adaption, of, uh, adaption and adoption of uh, techniques. It took us several years in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan to make these improvements. And, uh, you've done um, wonderful work as, as demonstrated by this very complex case in just uh, several months. The question I have uh, uh, really is twofold. One, um, what um, uh, is your status in terms of medical personnel uh, to care for these ongoing uh, complex wounds of war? And two, um, how is your country, again, adopting to the long-term care of uh, the ill and injured, uh, which presented a problem for us here in the U.S., um, but um, uh, where do you stand in terms of the ability to do the long-term care and follow-up care? Because many of these uh, cases require repetitive trips to the operating room, as you demonstrated, for washouts and, uh, and follow-up care. Um, but congratulations again. Um, you know, your country is, uh, and what you've accomplished is a beacon for the world. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. I start from the last part of it. So about the long term, about this patient, it's about the rehabilitation. It's about the rehabilitation center that we need to create. We don't still have it in Ukraine. That's why we understand the rehabilitation part. It's very important because like I present this case of this guy, you, you, you need to understand that he will have a lot of problems in the future. Probably he will have a mental problem, probably, probably 100% he will need some more difficult operation with his chest because it will be not stable. It, without the sternum, we need to stabilize it. And that all need the building the new, new modern rehabilitation system in Ukraine. Also, we have 
uh, like for the long term, we need to have and understand that we have a nice because hard maybe to uh, you even doctors come to uh, them. It's really painful when the operation they have limited stuff to work. We have limited suture. In this patient, you can use the back therapy system and the next patient you also need to use it but you need to choose from two or three patients just one can take this so it's the big problem and we need to have non-stop supply you know the war and the information when it's long going to use it became unpopular to all countries that are living in peace are tired from that but you need to understand that the war is still going so we need to help under this and uh, the, also we have an important thing at the beginning of the war when the war started we have totally no supply so my department in such situation um, when the war started army take off the, all the bandage material from the country to their needs and uh, at some morning I go to the work and my nurses come to me and said, the, uh, so, so what we need to do, we don't have the bandage material. So you need to understand in what condition it was. Now it's a little bit better, but supply needs to be always, all the time. And just a quick question again about the numbers of trained medical personnel. Um, where do you stand? Um, in trains? Uh, so the number of medical uh, personnel, doctors, nurses, medics. In the hospital? Throughout the country to, to care for the, the, the casualties of war. So it's very diff uh, different because um, of the east part of the country, the Russia destroyed more than 400 hospitals. You can imagine that they are destroyed. So the system of the doctors from this region comes to the west. Uh, part of the Ukraine and integrate in our system of the clinic. It's um, um, difficult to give answer of this question, but in our hospital, that you need to understand that it's the biggest hospital. We have near uh, eight eight hundred of doctors and near maybe one thousand of nurses. But we have a big problem in Ukraine. We have less nurses than the doctors. It's the old-fashioned system, and now we do. We need to change. It. Thank you. Awesome. Well, um, can't thank you enough for your comments. Um, we are going to take that picture for you here in one second. Um, first, I think uh, Dr. Armando. Uh, Retired military neuros neurosurgeon and still uh, on our faculty here at the university has a couple uh, gifts for you. And uh, I'll let uh, Rocco go first. Absolutely outstanding presentation. Uh, so I sat in that seat as well as uh, many of us here back in uh, 1986 to 1990, student looking upon what would my career entail. Um, and now I sit here as a faculty member, as a graduate. And I see the future of where we need to assist and where we serve. Um, we treat those who are in harm's way. Your country is in harm's way. And we are here to support you. And it has been um, truly an amazing process, as Dr. Woodson said, to see how much you have adapted, adjusted, and overcome in the past uh, eight months with very little to no support in terms of the logistical, the uh, infrastructure that we take for granted every day. Every day in our hospitals across the country, we throw away more equipment that's expired than what's available in all of Ukraine. And in, in many times, it, it's actually um, revolting for me to see that. Um, John Holcomb, Warren Dorlach reached out to me some months ago about some needs that they had for some neuroendovascular equipment, neurosurgical equipment, and I responded. I didn't get much corporate support, but I got an amazing support from many of the 
um, medical reps and device reps out there. And we put together several uh, large tubs that we shipped off to your military hospital in the West. But it was just a small amount compared to what your true needs are. Um, and we continue to plan on doing that. What I have here for you is just a small token, our thanks to you, um, one of which is um, a set of micro scissors for microsurgeons, given the fact that it's like that it inputs uh, microsurgery here involving not just neurosurgery, but also three flaps. Um, the other is our book um, that we have put together many years ago, back in 2007, with our Atlas of War Surgery from Afghanistan and Iraq. Thank you. Um, again, your experience here will add to these lessons. Um, and we are all very proud to be able to share this with you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. It's a bit long. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. And I also give you the present just a moment. I want to also ask the students who answer the question come here, please. I have for you present and for So thank you for your knowledge. I think you will save a lot of lives in the future. Thank you. Thank you for you. Thanks. So uh, we were able to give Dr. Hirsch uh, a couple of uh, gifts last night at dinner with uh, Dan Gallagher, uh, Daniel Holt, uh, myself, and, and one of our residents. Um, here we have a certificate of appreciation, of course, signed by uh, Dean Elster and myself, um, a Uniform Services University tie. Thank you very much. Although he's got, he's got the very U European style going with the shirt on <laughs> uh, Didn't wear a collared shirt at dinner last night, so I don't know if he ever wears ties. Um, probably an occupational hazard in Ukraine at this point. Anyway. I will go in my work with this. <laughs> and then, of course, you can't uh, get away from any military visit without one of our coins. Uh, so this is the Department of Surgery coin from the Uniform Services Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's picture? Yeah. 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 It's also for the university, the library, I think. Okay. And I it's also on. for you, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And for you guys. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. Daniel, you can, you guys get it. I'll text it to you. I'll send it to you and, you know, we can text it. <laughs>